Welcome everyone, this is the Life Enthusiast Online Radio and TV Network, restoring vitality to you and the planet. I'm your co-host Scott Patton, and joining us as usual is Life Enthusiast Health Coach Martin Vitella. Hey Martin, how are you today? Doing good Scott, thanks for asking, and uh, today I would like to treat our listeners to uh, having a subject, interview somebody really interesting, somebody famous and somebody intelligent and somebody who's got a lot of experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Patton. Well, thank you, Martin. <laughs> I, I thought it would be interesting to give people a perspective on, on what's going on in your life, because you're living a life that's sort of out of the ordinary. It's, it's somewhat magic, right? I, I guess I should say something like this. I think it's been about two years since you were um, of a fixed address. Yeah, almost two years. I guess I guess to, to give everybody kind of the foundation, um, I have my own business. The business basically fits inside my laptop, so I don't need I need an internet connection that works and is really good, but I don't need an office uh, or. Uh, a shop or anything like that to do what I do. And almost two, well, about two years ago, uh, it was pretty obvious that my youngest son, the last one still staying at home with me, uh, was going to buy a house and move out. So I thought, great. And basically took everything in the house, moved it into his new house, and so he could do with it as he wanted, and closed shop and headed to Morocco, actually. And for the next... Uh, well, till now, I've basically been around the Mediterranean, been to a number of countries in Europe and Eastern Europe, uh, well, in England and you know, so Western to Eastern Europe, and as far south as Kenya in, uh, in Africa. I was in the Middle East, Israel, Jordan, Egypt. Uh, and then uh, some business things came up and brought me back to Cancun in February of this year, and then back again, uh, a different business thing in uh, to Las Vegas. And then from there, I had to go down to Costa Rica. Uh, so then I spent a week in Panama and came down to where I am now in Medellin, a wonderful city in Colombia. I planned originally when I left to spend last year in Europe and then this year in Africa and next year in Asia and basically head east until I got back home. But... Uh, I, I describe it as being, you know, this big bungee cord that's attached and you just get so far and then it pulls you back. And I thought, I am not going to be crossing the Atlantic Ocean like 10 times this year. I'm going to stay on this side because obviously I have reason and work that needs to be done on this side of the ocean. And then once that's done, I will, uh, you know, continue on. So my plan is to do what I need to do in in Central America and then uh, which should be done by the end of September, then head home because I'm, you know, close. I haven't seen my family in almost two years. I want to see my mom and my sons and my sister and my friends and Martin. And uh, so I'll be home for, I'll be home for Christmas. And then I don't know, like I had this plan, but then the plan got interrupted. And to me, it's kind of like, it's not really clear the direction that I should go next. It's I'm actually being pulled west more, which is I have a, a project that I could be doing in Hawaii, and I want to. I love Australia. I want to go back to Australia. I have some friends in Southeast Asia that want me to come, so I could end up going eastward in the opposite direction, and then continue my African journey and my and go back to Europe. Right. So I mean, this was going to be a three-year journey. This is the way I had it mapped out. It may well. It may end up being a lot, a lot longer. I'm not sure. So anyway, that's kind of the foundation of where, why sometimes when we do these, maybe the picture is not as good as you're used to, or the sound might be not be as good. It's because I'm in like the Ukraine, or I'm in a Greek island somewhere, and it's just not uh, as as fast as we would like. <laughs> Yeah, they're not as well connected as we would want them to be, but it's coming along, right? Yeah. Well, what's surprising is where is really connected that you wouldn't think. So Nairobi, for example, was really connected. And I have kind of an interesting story because I, 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 when I travel, I travel in a couple, three different ways, really. One is 
I'm in, a, in Paris for two days, I just get a hotel, right? Uh, another is I want to go to Norway for a month. I will actually volunteer and I will volunteer, usually, well, in Norway, it was at a yoga retreat center, and I'll help them with their website and with videos and podcasting and all those sort of good things in exchange for accommodation and three square meals. So, and then the third way is Airbnb, which is kind of, which is where I am right now. I'm in an Airbnb. If you've got the, uh, if you, you know, if you've got the video version, I just showed you my room. Uh, it's a beautiful mansion and it was, it is owned by the son of, well, the, the son took over from the father. The father passed away. He was a sculptor and he sculpted these huge, huge bronze heads, you know, like you'll see these bronze heads in the store and they're, you know, like six inches tall or a foot tall. Well, these are like four feet tall, right? And uh, it's so this place is just absolutely amazing. So I, I kind of fluctuate between those, those three places. And when I was in Nairobi, when I went to Nairobi, I, I always ask everyone, how good is your internet? Because that's my number one concern. And they said, oh yeah, it's really, really good. But when I got there, it was an Airbnb, and she says, oh, sorry, Scott, the person that's staying wants to stay another week, so I got you another place. Well, of course, the other place did not have very good internet. However, I was expecting, because my expectation of internet in Africa is low, that she really wasn't telling me the full truth about how fast her internet was. So I had actually picked her because she was a 10-minute walk away from a co-working place, which is a place where I can go, and they'll give me a desk, and it's, it's like an office, and I can just go in and do my work, and it's usually like the best Wi-Fi in the, in the city, and it was. So it really didn't matter in that particular case. But you need to be flexible because things happen and things change. Right. And so <clears throat> that's a, I guess people could uh, follow you and your travels if they friended you on Facebook. Or are you quite judicious who you let see this sort of thing? No. Um, in, yeah, in, actually, Facebook is probably the easiest way to to follow my adventures because I'm always posting my pictures there, as opposed to Instagram or uh, any of the other places. So yeah, that that would be the easiest place. So if somebody tries to friend you, that they you usually let them in, yeah. Yeah, I I check to see you know if they look like they're crazy or my biggest problem on on. Uh, Facebook are 22 year old cuties that are fake. <laughs> like <laughs> you're not kidding. I have I have just the other day have been friended by one and she wanted to chat. And 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 hey, uh, what are you doing? Are you alone? And you know that was the moment I hit the um, block. Yeah, I was. I mean, just before that, you know, it's like I said, look, I'm not going to be a good chat partner. I'm not interested in chit chat. I help a lot of people. I'm a busy guy. If you need help, ask me. Otherwise, I'm not interested. And it was no, 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 blah, 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 whatever. And before you knew it, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just want to. I don't know what. I mean, what can you do over the Internet that would be of economic benefit? I guess you would want to help me uh, have um, sex on my own. I, I think that, and also, you know, Martin, I, uh, my mom just died, and my uncle is really sick, and uh, we 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 don't have any money. So could you help us out for a couple hundred bucks? Oh, that's okay. the that's the, that's the, or the other side of it is my uncle's got a half billion dollars in the bank, and we need someone who's white to sign it, and can you do that? So they're but to be quite honest, usually I just block them. But every once in a while, I'm just curious. And what I had noticed the last time was they said that they were from like Atlanta, Georgia or San Diego, but they were doing an internship in Ghana. <laughs> so that was the, that was the new story. Right. And I said, like, how did you get to Ghana? You know, and I'm just curious. And then I'm curious, like, how long is it going to take before you actually like pitch whatever the reason is, the real reason is, right? Yeah. And they've gotten slow at it. Like it's like sometimes, like this gal was like two weeks before, well, actually it was like two weeks and then she did something somewhere else and Facebook banned her. So that was, you know. Oh, okay. Facebook banned her. 
I'm thinking that all of this is some uh, Russian guy uh, faking the uh, location, right? Yeah, I don't. Faking gender, age, looks, location, and economic status. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I think it's all Nigerians and Ghanis, but uh, yeah, maybe they are. Yeah, maybe they are. I know some. Okay, Niger so I met some Nigerians so, and I met some Ghanis, and they are wonderful people. Okay, so just not thinking that I, I they just happen to be that the two or three times this has happened, they have said they're in Nigeria or they're in Ghana, and that's why uh, it well, came up, not because. I of mean, it started. It started with that famous prince from Nigeria who wanted to offer you a. Uh, Incredible deal, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. this, this goes back now 15 years when spam mail was coming in and all yeah. that. The trick, I, the I trick say, is not to be greedy. Like, you know, it's, why is somebody doing this? Uh, you know, they're pushing your greed button, and then, uh, you know, and and it's like, oh, easy money, and it's not. Never it is. Yeah. <laughs> I so I guess I would put it this way. The Nigerians are incredibly industrious people and and f smart. And so I'm thinking, how far could they have gotten if they actually did something that's like productive as opposed to just stealing things? Well, one uh, of the things uh, that I noticed when I was in Mombasa in Kenya was how hard everybody worked. But they were working very hard at very low paying activities. So, for example, there, you know, it's like 100 degrees, it's totally humid, we're on the Indian Ocean, and it's, you know, the sun is beating down, and there's this poor guy with a wheelbarrow full of something walking down the street. Now, he's got to be going 10 miles, he's, you know, he's drenched out, you know, he's sweaty, he's everything else, and I thought, like, that's not a lazy guy, but I think we need to look at systems like i really think a lot of the problems in in places that are poor is because there is a system in place that makes it very difficult and the system could be no internet no education no you know no good food no uh no opportunities right uh no education right like uh i think of i think of a lot of things that people have done and I thought, wow, like if you just taught, like one of the things that I did was I, I went and I spoke to a young entrepreneurs uh, gathering, a weekend workshop, where the weekend workshop was mostly me, uh, in Tunisia. And these people were brilliant. And so I would go in and I would say, you know, like we'd talk and everything else. I'd say, well, okay, how much money would change your life? Like, I mean, if you had X number of dollars all of your bills are paid. I'm not going to say that you're making any savings, but all of your bills are paid and everything is looked after. So you can just sit back and say, I don't have to worry about my rent and I don't have to worry about starving. 500 US dollars. They would be delighted with 500 US dollars. And I thought it is incredibly easy for someone online in the United States to make $500. So what I should just do is teach them that. And the first thing that happened was we don't have access to PayPal. So the way that you would receive commit, so I'm because like, what I thought was we'll be an affiliate and do some affiliate marketing, sell four products or post or promote four products, uh, you know, one a week, make, uh, you know, $125 off of each one. And now maybe it might take you six months to get the skill set and every, build everything to be able to do it, but definitely you could do it. And I know a lot of people that do $5,000 a month, you know, $10,000 a month affiliates. I'm sure I could talk to them and they would help me teach these people how to make 500 bucks, you know, and that would be giving back. But the first thing that happened was, PayPal is banned in Tunisia. So right. two things. And it's a terrorist country, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So two, things, two things that come up. One is the government is not helping because PayPal is massive. And the second thing was how interesting that the idea was poo-pooed because PayPal was gone. Like, is there not a way to get around it? Yes, of course there is. They all have accounts in, in France. Or I guess because they they were 
Tunisia and France are connected. Right. Yeah. You know, so this guy's got an account in France. So th I, the, the mindset was really interesting, right? Because we're like, well, get your PayPal account in France. Yeah, but then how am I going to get the money here? Who cares if you have the money here? If you've got an account and you have a PayPal in France, you can buy a ticket to Paris. Go there, spend a weekend, get however much money you want, as long as it's under 10 grand, and go yeah. home, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, just, it was just kind of like, no, we can't because, 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 and it was very difficult for them to think, out of the box. Out of the box, right? So yeah. would, would it be bad if you were poor in Tunisia and rich in France? How long can you go to France every year? Like, I don't know, three months, six months? So, And then how much can you bring back? Well, if you brought back 10, because I'll use 10 grand because that's what it is for Canada and the United States. If you brought $10,000 back every year and you only need $500 a month, that means you have four grand that you're not going to be spending that you can put in your savings account. So, <laughs> but this was very, very difficult to, to, in fact, I've gone further than I actually did with them because I wish I had actually written this out uh, and we could have found out the details. But you have to be, if you're, particularly if you're traveling, if you're doing what I'm doing, you are constantly faced with, I really don't know if tonight I'm going to end up in the place that I'm supposed to. I always have. But I always think, am I really going to end up where I mean to end up? And the best example of that was Machu Picchu, which was one of my, which was my very first trip where I'm thinking about. It was a six-week trip before I went on my, this trip. Uh, and it was really to see if I could actually do it. Did I really like traveling? Could I, could I survive in a country that wasn't English as the first language? Um, could I get my work done? So... I decided that I was going to spend a week near Machu Picchu at Yellow Lodge. And it was like 35 miles away from Machu Picchu. So it would be a day and a couple days in Machu Picchu and back. And then there was this week, a couple days before and a couple days after at this lodge. So I'm talking to the person, it's Airbnb, and they, well, we're talking, I mean, they're, we were emailing each other back and forth. And he says, when you get to Cusco or something like that is the name of the town, it's, it's quite high up. Uh, you go to this corner and there's buses that will take you. And they're really like vans. And I go, okay. And so I get to Cusco and I spend a night there. And I'm thinking, how am I going to get to this place? Like, how am I going to get to the, where the vans are? And I have my suitcase in my backpack and I go out on the street and immediately someone stops, who's a taxi driver, even though it doesn't look like a taxi, it's not a yellow cab, and says, where do you want to go, sir? And I go, this, and I've got it all written down. This is where I want to go. No problem. He says, you know where it is? Yeah, get in. And he drives me and he drives me. And we're going through these little streets. And turn the corner and there are three vans. And he says, there it is. So I pay him. And I go over. And like there's nobody doing anything. And as soon as I go over to talk to the guy, it's like they were watching me. And like 15 people glom onto him. So I'm like, great. Now i got to wait for these 15 people. They're all buying everything else. I tell them where I want to go. He says, you know, si, sí, senor, blah, 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 in Spanish that I don't understand. And 3.30. So we're going to go at 3.30. Great. We've got like 20 minutes to, to go. So he takes my stuff, puts it on top, and puts me into this van. And the van fits, as you can imagine, nine people. And there was, I think, 12 people in the van on the way. It's a three-hour drive. And in the, Medi in the Mediterranean, in Peru, South America, you know, where you're close to the equator, at 6 o'clock it's pitch black, right? So we get to Santa Maria, which is a small little town, and you, it's like it is blacker than black, except for this one little spot where he lets us off because there's three or four lamps, and there's like 25 taxis. And I know that I've got to take a taxi from here to Yellow Lodge. So I go up, and these now I'm dealing with 19 to 25-year-old. They all look 18 to me, but I'm pretty sure they were 19 to 25-year-olds because they, they look younger than they actually are. And, uh, and it's like Yellow Lodge, this, you know, blah, 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 blah. Jose! Blah, 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 blah. Juan! 
blah, 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 blah. It is obvious they have no clue <laughs> where this place is. And oh. it's pitch black, right? So, or none of them want to go, but they don't want to tell me that nobody wants to go. I don't know which one it was, okay? But finally, yeah. they all decide that they know where it is. CCNR, Yellow, we know, we know. And then they ask somebody, they call somebody else over, none of them, and he's even younger looking, and he's driving. So, so they, they, found, they found the fall guy. He had to take one for the team. Right? That's right. So we then go on a one and a half car width gravel road for another 45 minutes. All I can see is 10 feet in front of the car and beside me, which is basically straight up and down. Yeah, cliff face, right? Yeah, I, we're going along the cliff face. I can't see anything on the other side. I can just assume that it's the same thing on the, except going straight down. Right. And it was. Like when yeah. I was there, when it was light out, it's like this road just runs around the side of the mountain. It's halfway up. <laughs> There's, you know, and it is, it's easily half a mile from the, from the uh, creek, the river to the top. And so at this right. quarter mile thing, this thing goes. If, if you fall off, you're going to be pancake. You, you will never be, well, I guess you'd be found in the, di in the daytime. And this guy, and he's not going particularly fast, right? Because if someone's coming the other way, he's not going to, like you go around blind corners. And of course it's honk, honk, and you go around. And I'm thinking like, oh my God, like this is just going forever. And then we finally get to civilization, which is two buildings with a light on. He stops. I look into the, into one of the buildings and there's a courtyard. And I knew that there was a British, an Englishman and his Peruvian wife and, and their daughter. And, and so I see someone who's British looking and I think, oh, I've arrived. And of course I have arrived and, and we made it. And I said to him, like, you know, you should give us a little bit of a warning about what it's like to get here. And he says, if I did that, nobody would come. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I said, no, but I, I would have been a little more mentally prepared if you'd have, you know, this is an adventure, but I would have been mentally prepared if you'd have told me. So oftentimes in the journey and every time I have gotten where I, except once, uh, I've gotten where I wanted to go or where I expected to go. And um, the one time that I didn't, I thought I probably wouldn't because they weren't communicating with me. So I had a backup plan, which is always good to have, is if this, you can't find this place, go somewhere else. But there's always, you know, hotels and motels and hostels where you can stay if you have to. But uh, be flexible. And I think that's one of the things that you learn when you're traveling is uh, you got to roll with the, I mean, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I could be yelling at these guys. What good is it going to do? First of all, they don't understand me. And secondly, I'm lost, right? They know where they are. <laughs> It's sweet. So it's a cute, cute insight into the sort of goings on of an itinerant person, right? Like, I mean, you see all kinds of things that you would have never expected to see, or, or the, the unusual situations that you find yourself in must be just, I don't know what to call it. I guess fun. Yeah, you you go with an attitude of of adventure, of having fun of uh, being an ambassador for your country uh, or for your family. Um, I think that's sort of important. And also uh, the other thing is many, everybody has preconceived notions of white guys, old guys, uh, Americans, Canadians, yeah. and a lot of places the, I'm the only person that they've ever met, or I'm only one of two or three people they've ever met. Certainly in Mombasa, there was, I mean, aside from the place I was staying, which uh, had a lot of, uh, when you got out into Mombasa, I never saw white people, right? Like, mm -hmm. if you weren't at the resort, you weren't seeing, you know, you weren't seeing white people, you were seeing the, you were seeing the, the locals. Oh. Yeah. And they, so obviously they rarely would see me, 
right? So as I'm interacting with them, they're getting a different impression than uh, what they see on the news, for example. Right. And I think that's really important. So it works both ways. You know, I'm I'm sharing stuff with them, and and I'm learning from them, and I'm learning about their culture, but they're also learning that not everything they see on TV is necessarily the way everybody thinks, right? Yes. Yeah, the Hollywood version of the world isn't necessarily true. Um, <clears throat> interesting. So, I guess this life is not for everyone. You better be, um, I guess, wise enough to be able to navigate these things because you could easily end up in a situation that's quite unpleasant. You, know, you, could, you could get into trouble quickly. If you're the sort of person that goes into the mall and wanders around aimlessly and not paying any attention to the people around you, then you will be your eyes will be opened when you when you travel because you'll find yourself in relatively dangerous places. You know, it's like uh, it was interesting actually being in Barcelona, Spain, because everyone there said to me, "Be really careful. There are lots of pickpockets." Yes, and I'm. I'm kind of, I have, I had some arrogance around that, to be quite honest. Yeah. And because uh, I feel like I'm relatively, first of all, everything is hard to get at. And secondly, I'm relatively aware of what's going on around me because I don't have people to text, you know. So I'm standing and I'm just sort of, and also it's all new. So I'm curious. I'm just looking around, right? But the, the, the family that I was staying with in Barcelona she went in, it was about an hour train ride outside north of Barcelona. She went into Barcelona and they, someone stole her phone. Yes. <laughs> she's, she's telling me, like, be careful about pickpockets and she loses her phone, right? Yeah. So, well, I tell you, I had, I had my wallet emptied uh, in Prague in a situation where I left it with a place that I trusted. I thought I should, I, I thought I couldn't, but nope. Right. Anyway, interesting. Yeah, it's always a it's always a concern. And so you have to go into every situation with your eyes open and being aware of what's going on and making sure that you're not upsetting people around you because that's you know that's you could be doing stuff and not realizing you're really upsetting a bunch of people or uh, that you're not in a position where all of a sudden you're in a dark alley with three big guys, because I'll tell you, it doesn't matter what country you're in, every country has big guys <laughs> in it, or certainly bigger than me. And and then it's like, uh oh, you know, I'm, but I, you know, even the, and that, and this reminds me of the one, last time I was actually in Medellin, I was going from one place in Medellin to another, and the taxi driver drove me, and I, I couldn't tell if he was driving me to the drug cartel uh, hangout to be kidnapped or if he was actually driving where I was supposed to go because we'd be in a nice neighborhood and then it was like, oh my God, like this is like ghetto. And then we'd be in a nice neighborhood and it was like, oh my God, like this is really, you know, not safe looking. And then it was, oh, really nice. Because he was going through the, you know, he knew the direct route and I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, this doesn't look very good. And then, oh, this is all right. And so it was really... It's interesting, you know, you, and then you also have to watch yourself. Like, what you know, what are you feeling? Are you, are you aware? Are you, are you awake? Are you, are you feeling really nervous? Are you worried? Because when you start putting off the wrong vibes as well, then people pick up on it, right? So you have to decide who do I want to be. Well, I want to be a good ambassador of my city and my country and myself, and I want to be friendly and approachable, and uh, I don't want you know anyone thinking he's a arrogant gringo let's teach him a lesson sort of thing right yeah yeah this is a fool let's take him yes yes yeah got it huh. <laughs> thanks for sharing i hope somebody's going to feel inspired and inquires and uh, finds out if they want to find scott it's scott patton p-a-t-o-n-one-t um, just put it Facebook. put it into Facebook, and the one that says he's in Vancouver is me, or the one that looks like me is is me. And everything I post, I post public, so you'll see pictures from all over the place, and you'll realize quickly that this is the right guy. But uh, I think 
everybody should get out of their comfort zone. And most of us, our comfort zone is our city, our neighborhood, our country. And go around and everywhere I go, people are wonderful. They're friendly. They're excited to meet me, to, to hear about Canada, to hear about North America, to, to share about their place. And uh, I mean, it's different if you go to Cancun and you're in the hotel zona, right? I mean, just like if you go to uh, Miami and you just go to Miami Beach and spend all your time there. I mean, the, there are touristy places and then there is where the real people are. And you really want to spend some time where the re real people are and have some fun. And I know people that uh, actually know a fellow from North Carolina. He says the summer and winter in North Carolina is terrible. It's too hot and too cold. So summer and winter, he is for three months in Medellin. And then the spring and fall, he's back home. And that's his lifestyle. He just flies up, flies down, flies up, flies down, brings his wife with him, and they just love it here. And then they love it being at home. So, uh, But he's actually kind of like living in Medellin when he's here for three months. He's not, you know, at the resort uh, sort of thing. And that's what I would, re I don't know that I would recommend you come here for six months of the year. If you love it, great. But I would recommend that you take one or two of those weeks of vacation that you have and pick some place that's, and you don't have to like go hardcore Calcutta, India, right? <laughs> you know, you you know, you know you build up like anything else, but go into the French countryside or the Italian countryside or the Spanish countryside or to um, not touristy places in Mexico. Mexico is amazing and it's not at all what, 90% well, what 90% of the media makes it out to be. There are wonderful people there. They're friendly. They're helpful. Uh, they're terrific. Or Costa Rica, which is very uh, well developed, is it would be an, another good place to go. Spend some time on the beach. Spend some time near the volcanoes up in the mountains. Um, uh, you know, but it's some place that all of a sudden it's kind of like Belize would be another good one that's really different and will get you out of your comfort zone. If you're there a week, 10 days, and you have you know, an itinerary and a tour and some time to just be there with whoever you end up meeting, I think it's well worth it. Awesome. And so it's actually quite affordable, right? Like your, your lifestyle isn't, your overhead is lower than it would be in North America, right? Yes, so. but to be honest, you know, I don't have a home in North America. If I was paying a mortgage or I was paying rent uh, and having to keep upkeep everything, then they would be an onerous sort of thing. So, right. uh, you know, the decision that I made was a, a huge lifestyle change decision. And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to tell you that I think the best thing for everyone to do is to sell their house and move out of the country. Yeah. Uh, although there are more and more people doing it. Uh, but yeah, I, I would not recommend that. But I think that what you should do is save up two or three thousand dollars, buy a return ticket to some place that you would not normally go. I guess would be the best way to put it, and and go and see it. And Central America, I think, is an excellent place to go. There are some countries that are going through a lot of political turmoil and stuff that I would stay away with, away from, like Nicaragua, but. Uh, you know, Honduras is really interesting. It's got some beautiful areas. Costa Rica and Panama, are, they're about as close to being in America as you can be, except nobody speaks English. Well, a lot of people speak English in Costa Rica, not so much in, in Panama. But um, even just going there, you're going you're gonna to grow. And then from there, once you feel really comfortable, come to Colombia. Come to Colombia, you have no problems. Um, or, or Ecuador. Great. Well, all right, Scott, thank you so much for uh, sharing it. I didn't know how this conversation is going to go and where we'll end up with it, but to me, it's inspirational. Well, thank you, Martin. Yeah, and I, I'm happy to have the opportunity to, to share something that we don't normally get to share on our show. This is your life is so unlike mine because I'm pretty much tied to my desk job. I'm available to people 24 seven or at least 12 hours a day, whereas you are available only on the dates that you schedule. And, you know, and I think that what you bring up is a really good point, is 
it's very important that you take time to design your life, right? You decide, like I know, I spent 20 years running a grocery store as a manager. And to me, it was, I was just, I was in high school. I had a part-time job with them. I went to university, had a part-time job with them. I graduated. They said, oh, Scott, you've got a business degree. You must know something about business. Let's put you on a management course. We'll make you a manager. And there was no design. There was no question. It was just like, do it. And 20 years later, I'm looking at people that are 10 years older than me in my position who are having heart attacks, are morbidly obese, or have nervous breakdowns. And I thought, you know, I don't know why I thought it. That's going to be me in 10 years. I know why. It's because I was getting a pot like they were. And I thought, you know what? I can't, uh, I can't continue. And so I made a change. And then when I was making the change, as I'm going through the change over 10 years, at the end of kind of the 10 years, which would be 10 years ago, I thought, you know, like, what sort of life do I really want? And this life was what I really wanted. And one of the ladies that I dated 10 years ago, when I was somewhere and we're friends on Facebook, she said, I'm so happy that you're living the life that you that you want. And I thought, she's right, but how does she know? So I emailed her and I said, like, how did you, like, how did you know that, to say that? And she says, Scott, she says, when we were together, that's all you talked about was living this lifestyle. And now you're doing it and I'm just so happy. So it's not instantaneous, but I really think it's important that people sit down and say, what do I want in my life? And how do I want to live my life? And then what do I need to do or change to get there? And then Either change or not change. And it's it's up, totally up to you, right? But at least you've gone through the exercise, and I think it's an important one. Awesome. So, Scott, how do people find you again? Uh, if you want to know more about traveling in the digital nomad lifestyle and maybe some of the things that you can do, then you can email me at scott at patentmail.com. But in the uh, subject line, put something like, I watched you on Life Enthusiast or something so that I know that it's not some sort of spam because I get lots. Or you can go to Facebook and just put my name in, Scott Patton. Uh, I'm the guy from Vancouver. I think I'm the only one there. So I should come up. Or And actually, you can put my name in Google. And on the first page, there will be four or five that are me. <laughs> and you can have pick your pick. But don't use Twitter because I never get messages on Twitter. I hardly ever go there. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you for sharing. And um, this is Martin Patella for Life Enthusiast, where we restore vitality to you and to the planet. If you want to talk to me, I'm at uh, life-enthusiast.com. Thank you, Scott. Scott Patton. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time.